All right, folks, I know this is a crazy title, entire world of cross-border payments leveraging XRP, but as always, I'm going to explain why we titled this session. We're talking about moving uh, just a slice of this pie. We go somewhere fun, but we understand how big of a problem we have here with the payments fragmented. You got domestic payments, international cross-border payments is the mo where the most friction is at. And so I wanted to give an update on some of the partnerships that we've seen here with Ripple, some of the developments as far as the XRPL utility is going. And then we got statements and you know so much being revealed from not just the Hinman emails, right? But we got the Ripple emails as well. And there's some exciting stuff uh, to be found in there as far as behind the scenes, how ODL is working, the progress that's being had, and the mindset of Ripple going after, you know, I mean, we've heard the statements, put a dent in the universe, make sure that the XRP ledger can scale for all 7.5 billion people. And then what we're going to talk about is a direct quote where they talk about if the entire world of cross-border payments was levering, leveraging XRP, it is unimaginable what we're looking at, right? And so remember that. I'm not here to give you financial advice. I'm not here to give you hopium, but I'm here to explain the mindset of this company, Ripple, and what they're trying to do leveraging the XRP ledger. And of course, the native token to XRP being a big part of this new financial system because they've set it up in a way to be a reserve currency, but then also to be a utility ledger for moving every form of value imaginable. Let's get right on into it, folks. So we're looking at 7-2, July 2nd. 2023 and by the way tonight later this evening we're going to be posting our sunday session is going to be going live at 5 p.m pacific standard time get rich from xrp is the title of it we're going to talk about it and that's going to be happening later this evening now today i had to bring this update though because we see so much taking place with ripple and their partnerships that are just waiting to use xrp but before we do that let's take a look here at the market Thirty thousand five hundred fifty-six for your bitcoin 1913 for your ethereum and we have our xrp trading at 48 cents now we take a look at the sticks and xrp been moving sideways in a range between 50 cents here and about 44 cents you guys saw back on june 23rd uh, sorry, June 21st. That is when we topped out here at 52 cents. That's the range that we've been in for just the last couple of weeks. We're zoomed in here, four hour chart stretched out over the past couple of weeks. And you can see this range, not very exciting, right about 50 cents. And um, the frustration, the anxiety that the XRP community feeling is warranted, right? The frustration, I get it. It has been a long ride, but I put out this content not to give us false hopium, but to show us and keep our eyes on the prize on what's about to get unleashed. Now, to set the tone, we're going to share a tweet from David Schwartz. What better way to start off the session? And David put out this tweet. He says, me with a small piece of a glacier. And this must have been from his trip to Antarctica. David Schwartz, CTO of Ripple and one of the three creators of the XRP ledger, sitting there with a small piece of a glacier. And so I had to give out my decode. Got to start out the episode with the David Schwartz decode. And I say, even if we get a small piece, we will be having some fun. And that's where we're looking at. That's the perspective that I have going into this thing. We don't need to get all the money. We just get a piece of that action and we're going to be having some fun, folks. Now, I start out with this piece right here from the Kobesi letter. Uh, and we're going to be talking about Bank of America, which is a longtime Ripple partner. New FDIC data shows that Bank of America faces 100 billion plus uh, loss in the, pawn, in the bond marker. Sorry, folks. They face 100 billion in bond market paper losses. So the bonds that they're holding are negative $100 billion plus at the time of this recording. Bank of America claims it's not an issue as they don't plan to sell. Sounds like me and my XRP. When wifey asked me about my XRP investment, uh, we are still positive at the time of this recording, but I tell her uh, we don't really have a plan to sell, actually. <laughs> And he says, sounds familiar? That's because it is. Both Silicon Valley Bank and First Republic collapsed for this reason. And he's going to give us a thread. Some background. Bank of America is bearing the cost of decisions made three years ago. They decided to pump the majority of the $600 billion in pandemic era deposit inflows into debt markets. This was at a time when bonds traded at historically high prices and low yields. Many other banks were doing this right alongside B of A. As interest rate rises at the fastest pace in history, these bonds are facing $109 billion in paper losses. That's uh, called taking an L right there. 
Will Silicon Valley Bank and First Republic collapse for the same reason? When depositors wanted their money, they were forced to sell bonds at a loss. This is what caused the bank run. This is what caused the collapse. Good news for B of A, they're going to be deemed to be systemically important. They won't be allowed to collapse. It's also worth noting that unrealized bond market losses are an industry-wide issue. Total unrealized losses are at a record $620 billion at U.S. banks. This is well beyond the peak of $75 billion in 2008. So back in the great financial crisis, the peak of unrealized losses for U.S. banks was $75 billion. We have nearly 10 X that this time around. Now, why am I starting off with this data points? It's because we need to understand how big the problem is. The pain point that is now being reached. And this is what's going to force them to flip the switch. They're not going to come into XRP just because it's nice and cute and they want us to get rich and, and they care about us being butthurt that Brad Garlinghouse hasn't made us rich or whatever the thing the, the you know the kids are complaining about these days as we impatiently wait for our XRP to go to the moon, as the kids say, right? But what we have to understand is that once this pain threshold is achieved at a level that is unbearable, unsustainable, and they are forced to reset, they are forced to sell at a loss, they are forced to get bailed out by the U.S. government and uh, you know the Treasury Department, Federal Reserve, working hand in hand to keep this thing propped up, they let the little guys go. They let the Silicon Valley Bank go. They let the small banks fail. They don't care about the small banks, right? And it now was released that they bailed out... Um, the, it was released who they actually ended up bailing out, about 12 large depositors at, um, I don't know if that was uh, Silicon Valley Bank or which one that was, but that was recently uncovered. Um, but what you're seeing here, folks, is it's not a matter of, oh, DLT's cute technology, we need to understand it. It's no, we have to literally reset our balance sheet. And then we also need to solve uh, the friction that we you know experience in the cross-border payment space. 600 plus billion unrealized losses for all banks across the United States, Bank of America having one of the biggest net loss balance sheets. Now I say this and I just went and actually opened up a bank account at Bank of America this week myself. And so if you guys want to open up a Bank of America account, just go to my link on down below and feel free to check that. I'm just kidding. I don't have an affiliate link for Bank of America. But the reason why I feel comfortable putting some money in with Bank of America and actually using Bank of America is because they're going to be deemed to be systemically important and they already are a Ripple partner. And we're already catching word on the street, word from the Ripple conference uh, swell, that Bank of America is waiting for clarity here in the United States to use on-demand liquidity, which uses XRP. So I'm not telling you any financial advice. I'm not telling you who to bank with, but... I'm, I'm taking note of who's partnering up with Ripple, how they seem to be taking a different stance in the space. Now, obviously, they feel comfortable holding their bonds and they don't plan on selling and they might not have to because from the, the small regional banks collapsing, Bank of America received even more deposits and even more inflows and they just got some of my money. Now, I'm going to show you guys here, though, what I'm talking about. Brad Garlinghouse says Bank of America is a huge partner of Ripple waiting for lawsuit to end. So we take a look here. This came out from Swell of last year. And this was a direct quote from Nick Burafato, who is the director of member sales at Link2, also known as Mr. BXRP, one of the original XRP YouTubers. But he now works for Link2 and he went to the Ripple Swell conference and he's the one that shared this. Ripple Labs CEO Brad Garlinghouse stated to Link2 Director of Member Sales Nick Burafado at Ripple Swell 2022 in London that, quote, Bank of America is going to gain a competitive advantage when the SEC versus Ripple case settles by using ODL in the marketplace. Garlinghouse reportedly said Bank of America is a huge partner of Ripple. Bank of America stands to gain really big when the settlement happens because they are going to have a huge competitive advantage over their competitors by utilizing ODL and the marketplace. So not only are they going to have an advantage when it comes to providing the best liquidity in the world utilizing XRP ODL, but you have to look at and you have to speculate, right? If this, it, it, Hopefully this is a safe space where we can speculate a little bit. The institutions and banks like this that are waiting for the case to be over to utilize XRP might consider putting some XRP on their balance sheet, even if they can't directly hold XRP, 
but putting their name on some either through a pre-allocation contract, some sort of option deal. There's many instruments and contracts that can be written out to get their name on some XRP, right? And so one must speculate. When you see people like Bank of America, a systemically important bank, one that's, you know, you listen to the CEO, Brian Mahoney, He's been coming out and being incredibly bold with some of his statements. And I'm just thinking, listening to that, well, how come everybody partnered up with Ripple seems to be confident about the banking collapse, about the new system rolling out, right? All these guys are leaning into it, right? But then also you have to consider, does that, would that potentially help them solve their problem of over 100 billion of a net loss on their bond market holdings? right? If they're accumulating XRP with an options contract at 25 cents or 30 cents, or even today's price of 50 cents. Now, remember, they've been a Ripple partner, you know, since 2018 and, and before that. So they could have picked up some XRP at any point between now and then, or done the pre-allocation contract, right? Remember when R3 did the allocation contract, it was for 5 billion XRP, and they had an option to buy it over the course of three years at less than a penny. And that's why the deal went sideways, right? Is because the price went up to about 17, 20 cents and Ripple wasn't pleased with how R3 continued to lose their banking partners. Those were the banks that they, you know, Ripple was supposed to be introduced to and R3 was losing those partnerships plus, right, the, the options contract was for less than a penny and the price had gone crazy. That's when the options contract fell apart. That was during the 2017-2018 bull run. And then they ended up settling for 1 billion XRP. So R3 still got their hand on a billy XRP, right? And we know that Ripple obviously sitting on well over 50 billion XRP uh, through the escrow and their other accounts to divvy up to distribute, right? But what we're starting to see is a little bit behind the scenes. We're starting to lift the, the veil on Ripple's business models, you know, in particular with ODL and how it is working. And then the mindset of the employees of Brad Garinghouse and the company. And I'll tell you, I've seen some quotes that have been shared here from the Ripple emails. And, and if there's lots of people that are trying to spin these as all negative and this and that. And Ripple didn't understand their product and coming up with these crazy stories. When I see the, the statements that Brad was making to his company, I see a bold leader who understands the power that they wield with this asset, this technology, and the focus and the mindset of them was going after, I'm going to show you guys this, quote, if the entire world of cross-border payments is really leveraging XRP as a medium of exchange, that is going to have a significant demand side pressure on it. Kind of unimaginable when you think about the scale of this market. I am reading a direct quote here from a meeting that was taking place here at Ripple. And so this is what I've been finding going through the Ripple emails is the mindset and the plan was not achieved. It was just getting started and it's been underway. Now you fast forward to 2023 and you re reflect back on these emails and what they were talking about in 2013, 2014, 2015, all the way up until the depositions that were taking place just a few years ago. The business has grown just so much in the last three years, really since on-demand liquidity became a thing, right? And so for me, it confirms so much of our speculation on what they were trying to build out here and now we can confirm it through the quarterly reports that we're getting, and we can verify that they are achieving their mission. They are well on their way, or as Rosie Rios would say, the train has left the station. And so this is the direct quote from the team meeting that took place here at Ripple. They say, now in the long term, we we think that, you know, if there's sufficient value and utility in XRP as a medium of exchange, if the entire world of cross-border payments is really leveraging XRP as a medium of exchange, that is going to have a significant demand side pressure on it by the market makers and the receivers who are not just buying and selling immediately, but beginning to hold onto this to facilitate their payments on a long-term basis and starts to feel more like another currency rather than just a crypto crypto asset and that would have unidirectional demand pressure that is kind of unimaginable when you think about the scale of this market now that was so crucial the market makers and the receivers who are not just buying and selling immediately i.e using ripple's line of credit right utilizing odl with actually without actually having to hold xrp as we know many institutions are doing 
but they're not going to be just buying and selling immediately, but beginning to hold onto this to facilitate their payments on a long-term basis. You have another currency, not just another crypto asset. And this kind of pressure and demand is kind of unimaginable. This is direct quotes from Ripple, and I'll let you guys take it from there as far as what that means to you. Now, what it means to Craig DeWitt is that XRP is well positioned. I'm going to play this clip here. Crypto Cowboy Craig DeWitt on Twitter. He is being interviewed by Fame 21 More. That would be Darren Moore Jr. on YouTube. Huge shout out. Let's listen to what these guys have to say about XRP and cross border payments. Like domestic payments are actually decent today. Um, FedNow is going to make that a little better. There's going to be other innovations as well. The real problem in payments, like the, the, the one that, that, that hurts the worst is how you string together international payments. Because for domestic payment, usually you have a central bank and that central bank is able to do things as fast as they want to because everything reconciles to their ledger. On a cross-border basis, you don't have a supranational bank. There's no bank of banks, right? Unless you're talking about Citigroup. And so getting rid of those correspondent banks and just connecting to hyper-efficient domestic systems, that's a future where you could have instantaneous cross-border payment from, call it US to Japan for fractions of a penny. And you know that's, that's not gonna use a, a, a currency to do that, a government-denominated currency, that's gonna use a, a crypto asset and XRP is really well suited for that. XRP is really well suited for that. And similar to what we saw David Schwartz say about FedNow, Fed now up updates the domestic payment rails, but you still are going to need a bridge asset to bridge the different domestic payments when it comes to the cross-border friction. And this is what we've been talking about. Not only do you have cross-border friction, and I think the estimate is three, four hundred billion in cross-border payments alone, or three or four hundred trillion in cross-border payments alone uh, in 2022. Uh, but you you also have the uh, Domestic payment rails getting uh, updated through Fed now, but you the still are going to need that bridge uh, between the domestic payments and the the friction there. Like like Craig said, is instantaneously solved, uh, settling in a few seconds at just a few pennies would be the cost utilizing XRP. And you you know for me, I think that it's been very clear that Ripple had a plan, as they said here, if you think about the entire world of cross-border payments leveraging XRP, you, you, you will only achieve your wildest dreams, right? And so you might as well set the expectations in the bar very high. And then when we come back down to reality, right? Because folks would say, you're not going to get all the money. You know, you guys need to stop saying that you're going to get all the money. No, we understand that. And that's fine right? But just fragments of this whole payments landscape are literally worth hundreds of trillions of dollars per year. And so that's the issue that we're correcting. And we don't need to get all the money to go somewhere fun. As I started out the episode with the David Schwartz decode, right? He has the small piece of the glacier. If we just get a small piece of the payments problem, we go somewhere fun. And I wanted to also share, we have some updated utility coming to the XRP ledger that's going to be attractive to these institutions as well, because these institutions are going to be interested in utilizing NFTs. They're going to be interested in the metaverse. These are programs and plans that are probably down the road, 5, 10, 20 years, right? But when you go to use NFTs on Ethereum, when you go to use utility on these other chains, you see how they continually get compromised. They get hacked. You got gas fees and they just don't work. When we understand that Ripple from the very beginning was set out to make sure that XRP could handle all the money, right? That is creating that bandwidth. That is creating that liquidity to where you can actually facilitate these types of payments and these massive flows of volume. This isn't something that's achieved overnight. And, you know, like I always say with our XRP investment, if we're only 10% right about where this goes, it's still an interesting play. It's still going to be life-changing gains. And we see additional utility coming to the XRP ledger coinciding with clarity when it comes to the regulations, when it comes to the law and this SEC lawsuit getting the hell out of our way and us being set free. Now, the utility here, Intercoder from Crossmark IO, joined the XRP Ledger developer AMA to share more about their mission, their experience building on the XRP Ledger, and more. So this is going to be Crossmark. Crossmark is a browser-first digital wallet on top of the XRP Ledger, and it will provide an easy way to sign transactions and switch between networks. Okay? 
And they also share the Discord for the XRP Ledger. Join the XRP Ledger Discord to connect with other builders and learn about great projects on the XRP Ledger. And so the community of developers is growing rapidly over here. And we're going to get more from Ethereum and more from these other chains that just don't work. And the beautiful part is, is that we just got the Ethereum sidechain as well. Partnering up here with Pierced, what we have is a warm welcome from the XRP Ledger community on the Ethereum Virtual Machine sidechain. We already have 40 plus ERC-20 tokens. Some ERC-721 NFTs have already been created and several projects working on deploying new Web3 and DeFi applications on the network on the first week. You can track all the activity on the Explorer. We will keep you informed on the new activities. Now, interesting enough, Pierced is actually the company that partnered up with Ripple and the partnership with the Bank of Columbia. So the Central Bank of Columbia was the most recent central bank that announced a partnership in working with Ripple. That also is um, alongside in collaboration with Pierced as well, who is uh, the ones that brought the Ethereum virtual machine as well. That's going to be critical. And that's something that I always loved about XDC2 is when I interviewed Quincy Jones two years ago now, Quincy said that basically you could move your ERC-20 token over to the XDC ledger in the time it takes to drink a cup of coffee, you know, 10, 15 minutes. And I thought, well, that's amazing. And then now we see this same thing, the Ethereum virtual sidechain uh, side coming to the XRP ledger. This is what we need because the program over there at Ethereum doesn't work. The program with the rest of the space doesn't work. It's not scalable. And it's not just like little guys like us, right, that are trying to put in a little bit of money and play a little bit with it and get a little return on our DeFi. You have institutions with $100 billion losses on their balance sheet that are trying to adjust that, like I said, with Bank of America. How do you do that? Well, you pick up some XRP on the low and you're going to be able to hold some as it appreciates in price while also utilizing it for your own liquidity issues as in problems as well, right? You have trillions of dollars that need to get settled on a daily basis. You have quadrillions in derivatives, bonds, securities, and all the markets combined that have to go somewhere. And we just simply ask the question, how's your program working out? And we see with the program that's been implemented by Ripple, tremendous success in the middle of a lawsuit. Nothing is stopping or slowing this thing down. And I just wanted to put out today's update to remind our folks and family here in this community of that fact. Okay. Now, like I said, we got another live show coming here tonight at 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Make sure you guys get tuned in for that. And on the way out, if you appreciate this content, please smash that thumbs up. Hit that notification bell so you don't miss any of our content. And if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe as well. I will see all of you guys in the next one. And everything else is over on my website, ZachRector.com. God bless you all.